Happy spring equinox, plant friend. If you don't know today, the spring equinox is the moment in time when the day and night are basically the same length, obviously speaking for people in the Northern Hemisphere. We've had shorter days and longer nights all winter, which might have you feeling gloomy (laughs) and maybe triggering seasonal affective disorder in some of us. But today marks the welcoming of light into our lives, where after this equinox, the days begin to get longer and the nights begin to get shorter. And Mother Nature begins to wake up around us from her gentle rest. And sometimes it feels like we come alive alongside her. Today, we'll be exploring what the spring equinox means for the earth, for our gardens, and for ourselves. So welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care. Hello, hello, my sweet plant friends. Welcome back to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. If you're a recurring listener, I'm so honored that you keep showing up to this podcast. We're having so much fun. It's my honor to create this content for you on a weekly basis. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Maria. I'm the host of the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, and I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow more joy in your life. And when we talk about growing joy in your life and caring for plants, it's really about connecting to plants and connecting to nature. And I have developed the sweetest, most beautiful friendship with Raquel of Our Infinite Nature. She's been on the podcast before on the episode about cultivating your intuition with plants and plant magic and how to be a green witch. And she's, you know, taught me and inspired me a lot about plugging into the different seasons and figuring out how those seasons apply to my garden, apply to the earth and apply to myself. And so Raquel is going to be joining us for a little mini series. We're kind of nicknaming this Seasonal Sessions, where she's going to join me for the changing of each season to discuss what it means for the earth, what it means in the stars astrologically, and then what it means for ourselves. So we can connect with our houseplants and gardens on a deeper level because we understand what's happening energetically with the earth. And frankly, this stuff is just fun and interesting to talk about. And I hope you leave this episode refreshed and excited to embody spring. Speaking of embodying spring, I just wanted to talk really quickly before we dive in with Raquel about a quick exercise in my book that I love to do around this time of year, especially for the spring equinox. And it's a very simple concept. It's basically embodying spring through dancing. So take your favorite song, put your favorite song on and visualize being a seed that is being nurtured and breaking out of its shell, becoming cotyledon, having the cotyledon reach for the sun growing your roots deep into the earth and just let your body kind of awaken as the seed germinating through song. It's really fun. And by the way, that's one of the 60 exercises in my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, which helps you connect with plants to connect with yourself. So anyway, without further ado, this is a fabulous conversation with Raquel learning all about the spring equinox, what's happening with the spring equinox in the earth, in the stars, and in ourselves. So here's Raquel. Raquel, welcome back. So soon. Oh my gosh, I love being here. My favorite. You're basically just like a guest contributor at this point (laughs) to the podcast. You're my moon lady. I feel like any any kind of spiritual aspect of plant care, I'm like, I got to get Raquel to come back on and talk about this. (laughs) Oh my gosh, so gratefully receiving that. I am happy to be your moon messenger, your plant energy lady. Like that makes my heart soar. So thank you. Yeah, since our last chat, which we had that aired in early February that talked about cultivating our intuition with plants, I have to tell you, I have really dove back in with my plants and I feel like I've been more sensitive to their energies coming out of a crazy season, like getting back. Like the other day, Raquel, I spent two hours just moving around my house, taking every plant to the sink, giving it like the epic drink that it needed. Like I was feeling their energy that like they were hurting with the winter shift and I just gave them some TLC and it felt so good. 
and it was free. I was like, oh my gosh, this is free. This is like, this is the best mental health ever. And I feel like in connecting with them, it's made me more sensitive with people in my life. Like I feel like my, my sensitivity and my intuition is totally heightened just from plugging back in with my plants on that next level. So I thank you for that episode. And Plant Friends, if you haven't listened, you should go back to the episode I released with Raquel in February, where we talk all about cultivating your intuition with plants. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. And I love what you shared about how your relationship with plants and like really cultivating that intuitive, energetic relationship with plants is also helping you even with like your human relationships too. And like being able to feel into the subtleties of energy just in life in general. Because I do believe that plants are such a beautiful invitation to us for spiritual communication and connection. I mean, I, I believe that with my whole heart. Yeah. And I've been talking a lot about awe lately and like different just conversations I've been in. But like just when you tune your sensitivity to plants that much more, it allows for you to experience the awe of, oh my God, there is a new leaf unfurling. Or, oh my God, these spider mites really just took over my plant so quickly. I can't believe how quickly, you know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever it looks like, it allows you to experience kind of fascination and awe and adoration in a capacity that is so easy to not plug into. And then that also feeds into the rest of your life. That is so true. Yeah. I, I think sometimes we like forget about awe, unfortunately, in our day-to-day -day world. And I think that's one thing that's always been such a huge part of my relationship with nature throughout all the iterations I've had working as someone who connects people to nature, right? Like, yeah, it's always that sense of awe that is actually my connection to divinity in so many ways. Like awe is a spiritual emotion. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I was talking with a friend the other day being like, all of the trees are connected underground and talking to each other. Like, why is that not the only thing anybody is ever talking about? Like these trees grow leaves, lose their leaves, and then grow them again every single year. Like that's freaking incredible. And not only do they talk to each other, they share resources, they share sugars, they share water, they warn each other when pests are around or disease is coming through. There's real relationships and there's family lines too. It's incredible. Yeah. It's just wild. And then, oh my gosh, when I think about the fact that all the water that exists on this earth is all the water that's ever existed on this earth. And my mind is just like, oh. Like I can't. And then the fact that we're like 94% water, whatever the uh, the percentage of the human body, it's just, it's insane. If you really sit in it for a minute and think about it, it is, it's amazing. But as adults, we're not allowed to be in awe anymore. That's like a kid thing that everybody says. So listeners, mm, we're pushing back on that. <laughs> yeah, go find something to be in awe about. And I hope it's your plants. But I'm so excited to have you on in this kind of repeat spot. I apologize to everyone listening because I wish that I did it for the winter equinox, but I didn't get this idea until after the week equinox has shifted. But I had this idea that I pitched Raquel on to have Raquel come at the cusp of every season for us to learn more about the earth energies and how we can work with the earth energies. Because as gardeners, as houseplant parents, we always talk about fertilize in the spring, fertilize in the summer, dormancy in the winter. Like the seasons are such a big part of our life in terms of practicality. Like this is when you start doing this. This is when you start doing this. But there's an energetic way that we can deepen into the changing of the seasons and deepen our practice in our gardens or with our plants through understanding these energies. So Happy spring equinox. I believe this episode airs exactly on the spring equinox. How exciting. Yay. Yay. I love that. Well, I wanted to share because you just mentioned how, you know, gardeners and people who work with plants actually have kind of an innate connection with the seasons because of the relationship with the plants. And I really want to commend all of us plant people out there because most people in kind of Western society have kind of forgotten about seasonal living, right? Like the way that we currently live is this constant production. I mean, even when you go to the grocery store, you expect to always see berries, always see the fruit that you have. We have for completely always get apples, always get oranges, right? Like even though we know that these 
fruits and vegetables actually have seasons when they prefer to grow and when the conditions are best for them. We, through human ingenuity and technologies in many ways, have decided we don't need to live like that anymore. We can push past through that. Yet I think it's really created in a good way, this backlash of people wanting to come back to seasonal living. And especially when we think about like agriculture and growing food, one of the ways that we can come back to a more sustainable way of growing food is to come back to seasonal and local eating. So I think that those of us who are plant people, who are gardeners, we have this kind of edge <laughs> on the rest of society or, or, you know, modern society where we actually have this real desire and this understanding of the seasonality of life and the cycles of growth and production and rest that I think the world right now is hopefully coming back to this like remembrance of. But us plant people, we know because we communicate with the plants. We get it. Yeah. I mean, I think I'll speak from living in the United States, but I think the American hustle mentality has us perpetually in spring, summer, like sprouting incredible growth and harvest and does not allow us to focus on fall or winter. And I think that's a huge aspect of burnout is that, you know, when I was burned out, it's because I was running, running, running 12 months a year with no time off and no time to like rest and recuperate and start again for a better, a bigger, even better bloom, right? So I think, yeah, like that ability to kind of view the seasons around us and then those seasons internally is so important. So we're thinking the structure for all of these episodes, we're going to walk through what's happening in the earth in this season, in this this moment of the season's turning, what's happening in the sky. We'll dive into a little bit of moon and astrology stuff for those who enjoy that. And then we'll talk about what's happening in ourselves. So how can we plug into these changing of the season energies and learn to embody them ourselves? And every episode is going to have fun rituals and stuff like that. So Without further ado, let's dive into the spring equinox, coming out of winter, moving into spring. So what's happening in the earth right now, Raquel? So when we focus specifically on the equinox, it's important for us to note equinox is when we have kind of equal day and equal night. So it's a day of balance, truly. But what it marks is this shift of season from winter into spring. And when we think about spring, what's happening in the earth is rebirth regeneration. The cycle of life is emerging from the, that part of the life cycle that is death. It's important for us to note here on earth, death is not in opposition to life. It's part of the life cycle. So spring is that rebirth that comes after the death. So typically what's happening in spring is the ground is thawing, little seedlings are starting to grow. The seeds that have been gestating deep in the earth for months are now actually beginning to send out roots and shoots. We're starting to see little blooms and buds coming out on the trees and the bushes and our plants. Critters, we start noticing more insects coming out, more bird action. I mean, of course, depending where we live and how much here in San Diego, we have birds throughout the winter season too. I'm sure even in areas where you are, where it's really like, I'm sure where you are in upstate New York, you still have birds throughout winter as well, but you'll get more of them, more songbirds, more coming through. You'll start noticing more nesting behaviors in the animals as well. In my backyard, we have nesting turtle doves who come back every single year. They usually start showing up around February, but they don't start nesting until March. Their names are Dovey and Pecky. <laughs> My daughters name them. I don't know if it's the same Dovey and Pecky or if it's just their kids now who come back, but they come every year and they, they give birth to baby turtle doves in our garden every year from spring all the way. And you get to watch them? Mm-hmm. They usually have like five or six clutches, like from basically April all the way to about September. They have babies. It's it's the best. So there is this energy of regrowth, but there's also this energy of fertility, fecundity, abundance, growth, growth. Remembering too. Yeah, remembering. Remembering that, that it's actually that slow death of winter, that rest, that hibernation that gives us that 
that potential that then can be grown from. Like you talked about that burnout. If we're burnt out, we do not have the energy for regeneration. We might have the energy to continue to perpetuate a, whatever cycle we're in, but we won't have the energy for new creation, for fertility. So it's important for us to note that it is from this deep sleep death of winter that very yin, watery energy of winter, that we then kind of flow into this water and air mixture of energy that goes more into the yang energies, the active energies, that is spring, that then moves into like the fire yang energy of summer. All right, plan friends, March is here, signaling a time to wake our plants from their winter slumber and ignite new growth. The perfect way to do that is with Soltec's range of grow lights, the Aspect, the Vita, the Highland, and the Grove. They are all here to light up your home's dark corners and aid in the joy of propagating and growing your favorite plants. All of their grow lights have the perfect spectrum of white light that looks like any other light in your home that mimics the sun and sets your plants up to grow to their biggest, fullest, luscious capacity. I have eight of their grow lights in my house, which is insane. <laughs> and I love them all so dearly. I love their aspect pendant light. One hangs in my office. I have a ton of plants under it. Their Vita grow bulb is so amazing because it's a dimmable light bulb that can go into any desk or floor lamp. So you can take your existing lamps that you already have in your house, screw the Vita bulb in, and all of a sudden you have a highlight haven for any type of plants that you want on your desk or maybe larger plants that you have next to a floor lamp. Their Highland Grow Track System is a way to make a really big statement with more epic indoor greenery. If you want to light up a green wall, it's a tracking system that is very easy to install. And my new favorite product of theirs, the Grove, is their new Grow Bar. I have three Groves installed in my bookshelf. I've turned my bookshelf, which is also the background of my Zoom, into a highlight planty haven. So my Zoom background is filled with plants that are happy and healthy because of the Grove lights. And I love that they're dimmable and that you can touch them on and off. For the spring equinox, give your plants a little boost of new life with a Soltech grow light. And Soltech is offering our listeners 15% off with code BLOOM1515 at checkout. Go to soltech.com and use code BLOOM15 for 15% off the grow light of your choice at checkout. Whatever light you choose, you can't go wrong. I've got them all. I love them all. Soltech offers free shipping in the U.S. and a dependable multi-year warranty. Here is to a lively and green spring. Go grab that 15% off with code BLOOM15 at soltech.com. When discussing our connection to plants and nature, having a garden that reflects the earth's ecosystem and natural ways is in the style of what some people are calling a food forest is a fabulous way to grow food in a way that feels wild and natural. Say goodbye to those long straight rows of vegetable plants lined up and waiting for attacks from pests and diseases and say hello to taking your cues from nature and creating a garden space filled with layers of food producing plants with the new book, The Layered Edible Garden. In The Layered Edible Garden, author and food gardening pro Christina Chung of Fluent Garden on Instagram introduces a modern approach to home food gardening that follows nature's lead by growing plants in mixed communities instead of in agriculture-centric monocultures. Plus, it looks so much prettier. By intentionally including edible plants from eight different layers, so you have the different layers of your garden, trees, subcanopy trees, shrubs, vines, perennials, annuals, ground covers, and edible roots, in your home garden, you'll be building a mini food forest that will produce food for years to come and require less work and fewer resources. Raise your hand if you want more food and less work from your garden. My hand is definitely raised. The future of growing food is multi-layered. Whether you have sun or shade, a large growing space or a small one, planting many layers of food plants together results in a diverse, low-maintenance edible garden filled with plants that help support each other. So if this sounds interesting to you, this book, The Layered Edible Garden by Christina Chung, is a wonderful resource to get you growing in this method. So grab The Layered Edible Garden by Christina Chung and learn more for yourself. You can pick it up at your favorite local bookstore, bookshop.org, Barnes & Noble, or Amazon.com. That's The Layered Edible Garden by Christina Chung. So... 
with spring, while spring is a yang energy, is a, you know, a more action production oriented energy, it does still have some yin in it. Think about how in spring we can still have big storms, snowfall even. Sometimes we'll even have like a first bloom and then there'll be a freeze and it dies off. And then we have another one, right? So there is a little bit, even in spring, of this, and I feel like this is where air kind of comes in, this kind of tumultuous, like one day it's really spring-like and then the next day it's winter again. (laughs) I was just going to say, and how like poetic is that in terms of how many times when you take on a new new initiative or start a new business or join a new relationship, do you have that like two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back feeling? The image while you were talking that was coming to me, because yes, I do live in the Northeast where we get snow until May, is, um, you know, the crocus that kind of sound the alarm for spring, but they're still, they pop up covered in snow. So you get these like gorgeous blooms that is also still covered in snow. So there's like, yeah, but the rest of the earth is still pretty dormant, but the crocus are leading the way and everybody kind of wakens at their own time. I think it's also interesting to note that, you know, this awakening that's happening, this remembering that's happening, you know, literally like, because it's like, this is kind of a perennial play, the spring, the perennials, like the ones that kind of go to sleep and then wake up again, their triggers happen outside of themselves, either if it's temperature, like if it's the ground warming or if it's photo period, um, you know, the days lengthening, which kind of trigger them to awaken again. And I think that's also interesting when looking at ourselves. Sometimes, you know, if you are burned out, like you are not going to be able to like dig deep inside yourself and push through. Like sometimes you do have to just wait for the circumstances to be right around you in order for something to come through and present itself, which I think is pretty interesting and definitely a personal lesson I'm learning right now. I, that's such a beautiful, I love the way you share that. And I, I completely agree with you that there is this kind of like external stimuli that will stimulate the growth. But I think it's also important to note, even within that, there is that seed that has within it that intrinsic understanding of, oh, I can sense the warming of the earth, or I can sense the extension of that daylight. And that triggers within me, the growth that's always been the potential here within me. So I feel like, you know, when it comes to that, that question of nature versus nurture, when you think about like people and raising a child, for me, it's always like, that's the wrong question. Like, of course, it's not one or the other. It's always both. Right. And it's the same thing with us. Like, Even when we recognize that we're being externally motivated, that's touching something internal, right? Yeah. And it wouldn't waken something up if it wasn't already there. It needs to be there in order to be awoken. That's a great point. Right. And when we think about that transition from winter into spring, we can really epitomize or visualize that through the energy of the seed. Because in winter, those seeds, so many of them are, are like, think about the squirrels that like bury their little acorns, right? <laughs> and those seeds are just waiting in there. And they know exactly what they're going to become. The acorn knows it's going to become an oak tree. And the eucalyptus pod knows it's going to become a eucalyptus. And I mean, nature always has mutations because change is inevitable and mutation is fun. But (laughs) the seed carries the potential. And for us to even feel into in that winter hibernation, in that slower season, if we can have it, because that is a privilege in itself sometimes to be able to slow down, right? But if we actually are able to go a little bit slower, we can really feel into that seed of our own potential, what is going to want to come through us? And we're, we'll, you know, speak more into that when we speak about the energies of spring for each of us. But winter is actually an invitation into that self-inquiry that is what wants to grow from me. And that's internal, regardless of the external. So what's wonderful is that with spring, just like the seed, like just like the plants, the seeds of those plants can feel into the changing energies that then want more to grow. We have that too, which we'll speak a little bit more about, but we have that same thing. Yeah. I love that. Oh my God. I could jam on this topic with you forever. I love that thought. Also, you know, this episode being on the spring equinox, yes, we're, we're moving into spring, but also you mentioning like, what have you been sitting on sitting with in winter? 
sometimes the changing of the seasons is a wonderful opportunity to even just reflect on the past season, right? So just because we're in spring now doesn't mean you can't take a minute to like honor whatever your winter was. Think about if there's anything you have to kind of like wrap up in your winter before you move into the spring. But yeah, I think that's all so interesting. So that's what's happening in the earth. Now, what about in the sky? As I said, you're my moon lady and I've become quite the moon lady. And I think the moon has so many lessons to teach us. But what astrologically is happening in this spring 2024 that we should keep our eyes peeled for? Yeah. Okay. So, oh my gosh, you know, I'm all about the moon. And when we talk about like living with the seasons and and honoring the seasons, it's about living cyclically. And one of the reasons I love working with the moon, and I'm assuming you do too, is because it's also about living cyclically and recognizing that even in every month, we have this cycle of like regeneration, of new beginnings, of culmination, like that's always available to us. So with the spring, we'll have new moons and full moons, just like all the time. (laughs) But with the spring, we also have our first, at least for 2024, our first venture into eclipse season. (laughs) (laughs) Buckle up. Yeah, I'm not going to get into all like the astronomy of eclipses, but do know that it has something to do with the way that the earth and moon are rotating around the sun and how they kind of position around each other to block view of each other. Like that's kind of what's happening with the eclipses is like the earth is getting in between the sun and moon. And sometimes the moon is getting in between the sun and earth. And like, that's what's happening. (laughs) So with eclipse season in particular, eclipses are very potent yet chaotic energies. So when we hit eclipse season, which eclipse season usually starts with a lunar eclipse, our first eclipse will be March 25th. We have a full moon eclipse in Libra on the 25th of March. We usually will start feeling the energies of eclipse season before the actual eclipse. We'll start moving into eclipse season after the super new moon in Pisces, which is on March 10th. So after that Pisces new moon, we're going to start feeling the eclipse energies. And with eclipse energy, it's actually really wonderful for those of us who've recognized I don't like to hustle and try and control all the things because eclipse season is actually a time for us to be like, I don't need to drive the car right now energetically. Energetically, we're going to be like, I'm riding shotgun. Universe, you take the wheel. So for about a month, the the second eclipse we have is in April. We have the solar eclipse in Aries. And we'll talk more about the new moon in Aries as well. On April 8th, which just so happens to be the day before my next book comes out. Like, I really can't even make this up. And two days before my birthday. (laughs) <laughs> Your book comes out on my that birthday, is... Raquel. I didn't know that. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Love that synchronicity. Yes, yeah, so we have the new moon eclipse in Aries on the 8th. And then by the time we get to the full moon in Scorpio on April 23rd, eclipse season will be pow, will be done. But with the eclipse energy, what's the best thing for us to do is actually to, as much as we possibly can, go with the flow. Not try and force and control and like manipulate things to our desire. We're always co-creating, but during eclipse season is a time for us to kind of be like, you know what? I don't have to like white knuckle my way through this. I don't have to hold so tight. In fact, the best thing we can do is kind of let go and just be like, I'm going to move and dance and flow with the energies at play, which in some ways we have to do with spring as gardeners with the, you know... (laughs) lack of consistency sometimes that happens with spring, especially now with climate change, how sometimes we feel like we can have winter, it'll be snowing, and then the next week it'll be like 80 degrees. We have a little bit more volatility in the shifts between the temperatures themselves. So eclipse season happening in spring speaks a little bit to some of the natural aspects that happen in spring as well that can feel like they knock us, of course, blow our umbrellas over just as we set them up, right? You know, we just got ready. It's all warm. And then all of a sudden it snows <laughs> and we just have to be with it. So eclipse season speaks to that. Now, we also have a new moon in Aries on April 8th, happens to be an eclipse this year. Typically, astrologically, that's when the new year starts. So when you look at like the zodiac, Aries, is, which is you, right? <laughs> which is me. I'm a quadruple billion Aries. I'm all Aries. Yeah. You also have got to have Capricorn in your chart. I do. I have a stellium of Capricorn. I like that. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah. But my moon, my rising, my sun, 
my Mars and something else is in Aries. I have four major planets in Aries. Wow. Wow. So yeah. Yo, this is going to be a fun eclipse season for you, Maria. (laughs) Yeah, I know. I know. I'm like, oh God. But it's my understanding Aries is the leader of the Zodiac and also a very kind of aggressive, masculine. It's an initiation. Yeah. So Aries, the first sign of the Zodiac, which means the new moon in Aries is when the new year starts astrologically. So you know, in the sky, we're kind of being like, this is a fresh start, which completely aligns with the energies of spring, which is, this is a fresh start. We're starting anew. Growth is happening again. One thing I also want to just take note of when, in terms of eclipse, because this new moon in Aries is eclipse, we're going with the flow during eclipse season, because during eclipse season, the universe is like, I'm moving the pieces here now. So often eclipse season comes with big collective change, sometimes chaos, unfortunately, Israel, Hamas, Gaza war started during our last eclipse season. So that's just kind of an example of some of the energies we're dealing with in eclipse. It's stuff that's out of our control. But one thing that's really important for us to note with eclipse season is an element of faith, of recognizing that things that are happening during eclipse season are, I don't always like to use this word, but I'm going to use it here, are faded, are destined. This is the universe moving pieces around so that it kind of takes all of us down a pathway that's going to lead to a greater good. Now, time frame wise and timing, it's hard for us as humans to see the greater good when we're in the midst of the dumpster fire that is sometimes eclipse season or just life in general here on planet Earth, right? Like, <laughs> let's just be honest with what's happening, right? But there is that element that comes in of faith, of the universal timeline, which is which we can feel into when we work with trees, for example, of understanding that the human time frame is really short. Like we look at time in such a minuscule way compared to how nature looks at time, how trees look at time, how plants look at time and how universe looks at time, which is that it doesn't even exist, <laughs> which like that totally blows my mind. Yeah. And there's eclipse season every year. So it's not like, it's like we go through this, twice a year. So we go through these eclipse, like we've gone through the eclipse seasons every year of our life. So it's, it's not like the end of the world. It's just a different flavor of energy. So what about the, are there positives for us to look forward to when it comes to this area besides eclipses? I actually look at eclipse season kind of positively. I mean, yes, there's chaos and things that happen, but there's also a lot of positive change that comes from eclipse season. And for me as I struggled in the past with entrepreneurship and feeling like that hustle, production, got to prove self, got to always do and produce and be relevant, blah. Like for me now, feeling eclipse season as a time to kind of rein in and just go with the flow. To me, it's actually really restorative. I find eclipse season to be a little bit more calming and restorative, even in the midst of like, I don't know what's happening outside. or what's happening in the world might feel uncomfortable. There is a level of faith that can be really beneficial, especially when living through transformative times. And I don't say to use faith in a way to repress or to avoid or to deny, but to come back to an understanding that as hard as things might feel or might be, there is still an energy of love, an energy of expansion, an energy of connection that flows through all things that's always available to us. So it's like you can look at a glass of water and if it's just right in the middle, it's always our choice if we're seeing that as half full or half empty. That's our choice. And I think nature helps us remember that despite it all, we can look at the world as being a world of connection and symbiosis and interconnectivity, despite it all. So beautiful. Despite it all. Anything else in the sky before we move into in ourselves? I just want to note a little bit in terms of, especially with spring and gardening, when working with the moon in particular, because we can really work with moon energy when it comes to gardening, to harvesting, to even pruning and propagating our plants. So just understanding the moon and its energies in itself, 
the new moon is very similar to the energy of spring, which is an energy of rebirth, of a new beginning of planting seeds. So when it comes to our actual gardens, a fantastic time for you to maybe start a garden. Of course, first and foremost, it's going to be the temperature, like your weather, yeah, <laughs> your climate, and your the weather. Zone, like the depending zone. on your garden zone, blah, 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 disclosures. Yeah, totally. Yeah, all the physical realities first and foremost, right? But then after that, if your land is like, okay, I'm ready for you to start planting, a really great time for you to plant a garden would be with a new moon. So depending on what that means for you, you can plant with the new moon in Aries. That's on April 8th. If you're someplace where it's warmer, you can plant with the new moon in Pisces we have in March. You can even plant later in the spring and into the summer as well. But planting with a new moon works with that energy of new beginnings, fresh starts, and is just a really beautiful way to work with the lunar energies. Now, when you want to also, when it comes to fertilizing, like a little bit further down spring, as we get closer to summer, fertilizing new moons or when the moon is growing. So between the new moon and the full moon, fantastic times to fertilize as well. When you want to prune or harvest, you want to do that with a full moon. Full moons are about illumination and release. And when we think about the full moon and how it like pulls at the water, especially when we're at a point where we're actually harvesting any kinds of produce from our plants, whether it's fruits or vegetables, when we harvest with the full moon, it's like the fruits and veg, the produce itself has the tippy top of the energy of that plant in that moment. So the full moon is this big culmination of energy. So if we harvest at that time, our produce will also have like this big, almost like the, the most energy can really take in is at that full moon time. So harvesting around full moon is great. Pruning and pest control, full moon activities. Getting rid of, releasing. Yeah, yeah. And also illumination, like with some of us, the, the plant, the pests in particular, we don't see them right away. You have to actually get in there and look. The energy of a full moon is to see things we're not always seeing, right? So pest control is also really good to do around a full moon. Oh, I love that. I really want to do an episode on biodynamic gardening, like, because there are gardeners who live and die by the moon cycle, you know, like the whole garden is run on that. I I'm really want to look into finding an expert for that, but that's amazing. I love that. And we'll talk about in a little bit how the lunar cycles can apply to ourselves as well. So so beautiful. Now, spring, what does our internal spring mean? So how do we take the spring equinox energy and bring it into our lives and use it to help us restore, refuel, thrive, you know, grow, all those good things, all those good words? Yes. So obviously, I'm going to assume, you know, spring is a great time to take care, wrap up your winter and step into your new beginnings, your new growth. Your remembering of your DNA of what you were supposed to, what you were just saying with the seeds, like, you know, remembering that you have it all inside you and you can kind of wake up and flourish. So if we want to work with spring energies, what are some planty practices that you would recommend us doing to kind of deepen into that? Ooh, well, actually, one of the first planty practices that I think is fantastic for spring is something that you highlighted not too long ago, which is like a home plant audit, doing a little spring cleaning with your plants. A spring cleaning. Yep. yep. Yeah. That is a fantastic way to work with that plant energy and your own energy for spring. The whole desire, like that whole spring cleaning thing, that to me is actually humans remembering seasonal living. Most of us spend more time indoors, in our homes, in our caves, right? Like hibernating during winter. It's the windows have been closed. The air gets a little stagnant after time, right? And as we feel that fresh air, the warmer winds of spring, we just can't help but want to open up all the windows in our home, bring in that fresh air, that fresh energy. And that also, that freshness usually gives us this desire to declutter, to get rid of things, to maybe even put away the winter clothes. Make space. Yes, make space. Because ultimately, and we can think about this in our gardens too, when we want to plant new seeds, we have to create space for them. We need to prepare the soil. If we already have a bed that's filled with weeds or even herbs, 
we will not be able to allow the plants we want to grow to have the root space or the top of the soil space to be able to thrive if we don't create that space for them. So as we move from winter into spring, as we move from death into rebirth, we want to clear out anything that's going to remind us of that death, of that quiet season, so we can bring in the energies of action again, of creativity, of eagerness. And I feel like that's something that comes in with spring a lot. There's like this very intrinsic eagerness that people feel, whether it's to get outside after being inside for so long, whether it's to dive into something that they've, they're curious about, whether it's to start a big project, to paint a room, to totally change the style of your room or even your style. Sometimes people will even like want to get a big haircut or change their style. All of that is coming from this innate seasonal expression of regeneration and rebirth and remembering that change is one of the only things we can really count, count on and is constant for us here on earth. It's humans. I feel like it's so fascinating that we've created this world of straight lines right? Like even in our houses, everything is like straight lines. When we think about our journey and our path, it's like we start here and we go there and it's a straight line. Even our growth should be just a straight line up, right? Nature doesn't work in straight lines. Nature works in circles and spirals and waves. Even trees, like even the things that we think are, even bamboo, right? That seems to grow straight up. It's not really that straight. And not to mention, you can see the way people can actually train bamboo to become like a spiral, a braid, whatever, right? So anything that helps us move away from this very kind of rigid, linear approach to our life <laughs> is going to help us feel like we're living more in the natural cycles of seasons, of dormancy and regrowth of allowing, oh, and I also wanted to mention, because this is a big energy for spring equinox in particular. And this is the same for autumn equinox. So for all of our Southern hemisphere friends who are actually experiencing autumn equinox, while we on the Northern hemisphere are experiencing spring equinox, equinox energy is always a remembrance that the dark and the light are equally valuable and necessary in our life expression. The seed needs the dark soil to germinate in. If you expose it to too much light before that, it will not grow. And the equinox is a reminder for us that the day and the night, equally important. Our light and our dark, equally important. So as we are moving from winter into spring, and I know so many people are affected by seasonal... Um, Affective disorder, yeah. Yes, thank you. So many people are affected by that, especially when it gets really cold and it's the days are shorter and darker. So as we kind of move and transition into the, the, the days getting longer and now actually being equal, we can actually really work with the energies of the equinox and of spring by embracing our shadow, embracing the parts of ourself that maybe aren't so warm and fuzzy, aren't so light and love, but recognizing that those are part of what makes us whole. And that actually, that integration, that embracing of our fullness and our wholeness, that is the motivation for true creativity. I think sometimes we feel, especially in Western society where everything is like produce, 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 stay relevant, generate income, all the things, right? There can really be this energy of repress the things that are undesired. But that leads us into more burnout. And that leads us into the energy of shame, which really, really dilutes our curiosity, our creativity, and of course, our self-love. And you can't have spring without the winter, right? You need the darkness in order to have the growth. So they're both in equal parts necessary for your success and wellness, which I think is important too. Sometimes even just with your shadow or with your darkness, it's like the deeper and darker you're willing to go is also the lighter and high that you can fly. What's the saying? As below, so above or as above, so below. Yep. So beautiful. So with spring cleaning, you know, I know there's like, you can go listen to like an organizing podcast to be, be like spring cleaning checklist for your house. 
But for your plants, especially with your house plants, you know, this could look like giving a little bit more than your general plant care, not, you know, maintenance. So like doing, you know, I put my plants in the shower and I give them a rain shower. I give them all like a really thorough rinse down, spray down with some horticultural soap, like some really good kind of pest prevention, pest management, cleaning the leaves to make sure that they're nice and shiny for the spring and they can start soaking up the extended photo period as the days get longer repotting, pruning, you know, the yellow or brown leaves. If your plant suffered in the winter, like you don't need to be reminded by that. Like prune those suckers off, you know? (laughs) Aerating the soil, actually going in and aerating. Yeah, aerating, exactly. That'd be great. Yeah, so there's a ton of, you know, plant-based spring cleaning that you can do. And then outdoors in your gardens, you know, making sure that you're cleaning up your debris after you left it for the winter for, you know, for your local wildlife. Turning over the soil. Yeah, that's a big one. I like to do in spring. Turning over the soil, making sure you've got your seeds, making sure you've got your garden plan. You know, it's about to get real busy if you're an outdoor gardener. So I think those are all really beautiful ways that you can kind of honor your spring cleaning energy. What about plants? Like, do you have any particular plants that embody that spring energy? Yeah. I mean, there are so many. If you think about like all the plants outdoors that are just budding. Yeah. Most of them come alive in spring. Yeah, totally. I know. But when I think about house plants, there were two plants that really came to my mind as really kind of embodying a lot of that spring energy. The first one, and I think you just did a whole feature on these guys actually, is alocasia. Yeah, yeah. I For me, and I think with alocasia, sometimes your alocasia might not do as good in winter, right? Like sometimes they'll start getting those leaves that... Yeah, there is a dormancy aspect. Yeah, they have that dormancy. But what's interesting is I've had some alocasia in the past that like have lost all their leaves. And I'm like, I, I don't know, is this plant dead? And yet spring comes and they're like, whoa, like they're totally alive. New leaves, they look amazing. So for me, alocasia has always been very much like a regeneration, like spring energy. Plus when I sat with alocasia in meditation for everyday plant magic, they sing to me. Oh, they literally say like with their energy, their energy felt like a choir. There was no words. It was just tone. So it was just like, ah, but it was all these because most allocation, I have one behind me right there. They have like more than one. They have this kind of collective energy to them, which is why I consider their gender more they them. But they just have this really collective energy and they harmonize with each other. And for me, I don't know why, but the elements of harmony and like voices being raised together and enmeshing with each other and making a beautiful sound that to me really epitomizes spring (laughs) I love that oh my god I'm gonna look at my alocasia differently now after you say that but you make so much sense I want you to go listen to your alocasia like to actually go and listen to them because they're singers I'm gonna go listen to my alocasia Yeah, it's so beautiful. And I have a bunch of them all together over there. So I'm totally going to do that. Oh, that's so beautiful. Okay, so you said allocation. Then what was the other one? My other one that for me is very, just has a lot of spring energy is syngonium or our head leaf plant. There's something about the way that they have a lot of yin and yang energy. They really have a lot of both. They can climb and yet they can also drape and the way that they grow. Like they just are like, grow, 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 grow. And they have this beautiful heart-shaped look to them. Some of them have this really beautiful pink coloration in their leaves. Like you can find some that are like really pink and or peach colored. And they're just kind of take you right into this heart space with this balance of masculine and feminine, with this focus on productivity, but in a way that feels soothing as opposed to like Sansevieria that's like go do it like allocation is like yeah we're gonna keep expanding but we can do it at our own pace at our own time we can dance our way through also like you said with the eclipse energy like being kind of just receptive and you know going with the flow I love that I love that for the syngonium too yeah oh my gosh yeah I didn't even think about that but that's so true yeah so syngonium was the other house plant. When I was thinking about like some of the other plants that want to come through, jasmine actually came in really strong as a big spring energy. At least where I live in San Diego, like I'm already starting to see my jasmine put out buds and it's only January. <laughs> but typically by April, our jasmine in the neighborhood is just going off and you can smell like that beautiful jasmine smell just like 
wafts down the whole street. Like it's just so lovely. So jasmine to me is really one because first of all, the smell of it is so potent. And I find that jasmine is a scent that really carries far with the wind in particular. Like some flowers, you have to get really close to smell them while other ones you're like, I smell jasmine and it'll be like across the street, you know? Yeah. So jasmine has this this like really potent smell that I feel like really kind of encapsulates the energy, that fresh energy and that optimism of spring. To me, jasmine is a very optimistic plant. Like every time I smell it, I'm like, anything's possible. Also, I feel really sensual <laughs> when I smell jasmine. Yeah, totally. Totally. Oh my God. It's so beautiful. Yeah. It also has a really powerful relationship with the moon. Um, like there are certain jasmine that only bloom with the moon. They're actually called night blooming wow. jasmine. Yeah. So jasmine has a really, really beautiful connection with the moon energies. So I also really, really like working with jasmine during eclipse season as well to maintain that sense of optimism and that sense of receptivity. I was also thinking microgreens, which I've been just selfishly like thinking about starting, but that concept of, well, you know, like I said, it snows here where I live until May. So come spring, like come March and April, like I'm losing my dang mind still having snow, you know, yeah, the crocus pop through, but like it's, it spring happens later physically for the earth here where I live. And I always find like come March, I'm like, I just got to start some seeds. I don't even know, like I'll start seeds knowing that they won't even make it into my garden, but I'm like, I need to see green burst through <laughs> a seed immediately. So I feel like microgreens could be fun because you're going to replicate that and crocus, but replicate that like seed bursting forth kind of energy in your home and then also getting to eat it. That's like ingesting that energy too. Yes. I love that. Not to mention how potent those microgreens are nutritionally. Like they're, they're just packed with micronutrients and like, they're so good for you. So yeah, I love that one. You had mentioned crocus earlier. That's another really good spring plant because of the way that it's like a reminder, especially because like it come up, it comes up in snow. It's, it's a beautiful reminder to us that spring is coming. They're just these little like, it's okay, spring's coming, even though it's still cold, even though there's still snow, rebirth is coming. Borage is another really good one for spring. You know, borage is one of my favorites. What I like about borage is that it really helps the mind, the part of the mind that likes to hang on to something, cling on to it and not let go, right? Like borage really helps us relax that part of the mind that is constantly needing to prove relevance or prove self, which when we feel that kind of motivational energy of spring, if we don't really balance that with some of that yin energy that's still here with winter, right, we can feel ourselves kind of rush into that hustle place, that proving self place, if we don't ground it back into using nature to help us be in the cycle of just just creation for creation's sake, not creativity to prove worth. You know what I mean? No, that's so beautiful. I love that. That's a really good one. Oh, and another thing I want to share, and this is this is more of an intuitive practice. And this is actually an indigenous practice that I learned through Robin Wall Kimmermer through her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is an amazing book. Love this book. But this is for you to actually become aware and take note of the herbs, even the weeds, the flowers that are just naturally growing around your home, around your workspace in spring. So if you go outside and you're like, whoa, all of this nettle is growing here. Wow. Like that's interesting. And it's just growing like prolifically. That's actually the earth letting you know, this is something you need. This is a medicine for you right now. So I always take note of like what is naturally growing in my beds or around my home. What am I like? Am I seeing a ton of dandelions? Dandelions are so powerful medicinally, not to mention magically, right? They're amazing for heart health. You can find so many different dandelion teas and tinctures out there right now because people are remembering, oh, wait, this isn't a weed. This is a medicine, right? So for you to actually work and be in communication with Mother Earth by being aware of receiving the gifts she's naturally sending to you through the growth of these plants. What if mint is taking over your garden? It's probably that you could use mint in your life at that moment. 
Sephora, like whatever, like your rosemary's going off, right? Like, hmm, maybe this is a good time for you to cook with more rosemary, dry out some rosemary so you can also smoke cleanse with it. Lots of ways to use it. Not to mention magical uses of all these herbs and flowers as well. But a really great practice, especially with spring, especially as we're seeing this this new growth come in, is to be aware of what are the magical, medicinal, even culinary herbs or weeds or flowers that are just organically popping up around you, because that's a conversation with earth. Yeah. Oh, gosh, I love this. And it makes me think of like, what I'd love is for you to walk us through a little meditation on spring. So if we want to kind of deepen into the earth's, you know, energies and kind of how to harness this, I would love to ask you that. But before that, what I thought was, I will give a shout out. She was recently on our podcast. Her name's Perla. And she just came out with a book called Verdura. And she has like this exercise in her book where you get a bowl and you fill it with some moss. And then when you go out, you just find like whatever's in bloom and you bring it back and you put it in your bowl. And it's just this like kind of seasonal bowl right at the entry door or in your office. And I don't even think we talked about that practice in her episode, but it was this really beautiful, really beautiful practice she talked about. And so as we encourage you through these these seasonal sessions, go around on the spring equinox today or sometime this week or sometimes in the next couple of weeks and make yourself a little altar for spring, right? Like what is in bloom? What what do you find outside? Or if you're not doing it outside, you know, is there a house plant that's putting off a new leaf or that's starting to grow again that you can put in this little offering as you dive into this meditation, listen to this podcast, do your spring cleaning, you know, as you try and kind of deepen into these energies. Yeah, I just love that idea. Oh my God, I love that. I love that you shared that because I was actually just going to say altar is another thing. And that's one thing I do with my kids actually is for the spring equinox, for the summer solstice, for winter, uh, for autumn equinox and for winter solstice, my kids and I will go out on a nature walk and we'll bring some scissors and a little basket and we'll collect items from nature. Usually we'll try and find things that have already fallen on the ground, but every now and then we might ask a plant if it's okay to clip this flower or clip this little branch, right? And we just go find things that kind of represent that season to us. And then we bring it home and I have an altar downstairs that's kind of more like my ancestral altar where we have like pictures of family members things like that. And that's where the I have the girls help me create an altar for the season. And so we'll, you know, grab things from outside. And then I always want to bring in something to represent each element. So something to represent earth, water, air, fire, and then something for spirit, which is usually us, like what we bring to the table. So there's usually a candle there, bring some crystals, maybe a house plant or a vase of uh, cut flowers and water, right? So Making an altar, there's lots of different ways to make an altar. I actually talk a little bit about that in Everyday Plant Magic, but yeah, making an altar for the season is a fantastic way to work with the energies of the season to really kind of honor them and show your respect and your appreciation. And then if you have kids, it's such a fun thing to do with your kids. It's like so much yeah, fun. Yeah, and to start them young, get yeah. them embodying nature's energies young. So as a closeout to this first in the inaugural seasonal session on Growing Joy, will you lead us in a short spring awakening inspired meditation that we can all kind of sit with as we think about spring this year? Yes, it would be my pleasure and my honor. So for all of you who are listening in right now, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for honoring the energies of spring, honoring the energies of your own creativity, the rebirth that wants to come through you. So let's just take a moment, allow yourself to find a comfortable place to sit or lie down. Let your hands fall comfortably at your side, palms up or down, whatever feels more comfortable, more relaxing for you. And just take a moment, become aware of your breath, welcoming in the inhale and releasing with the exhale. (sighs) Nice. Gently wiggling your toes, maybe rolling your ankles, bringing your energy into this body, this beautiful body that is your home, this beautiful body that does so much for you bringing your energy to this here and now moment, bringing your energy to your place, 
here on earth, being housed, being held by this living interconnected planet. Taking a nice inhale through the nose, breathing into the lower abdomen, then up into the chest. And as we exhale, imagining beautiful glowing roots extending from our feet down into earth, moving with grace and with ease through the floor, the foundation of the building, and those top layers of soil. There's no resistance to your roots as they extend deeper and deeper into earth. Finding a place to anchor. Finding a place where they want to stop and be held. And this time our roots are actually extending deep into a tight little space. A spot where a seed is planted. And I want you to just see the seed in your mind's eye. Notice its size. Any color you might notice. Notice the temperature. Is it warm? Is it cool? And seeing your roots tapping into the seed, wrapping around the seed, and beginning to breathe the energy of earth and the energy of this seed up into the body now with a deep inhale. Breathing that energy up into the feet, into the legs, all the way up to the hips. And as we exhale, letting that earth and seed energy settle in the body. Good. Feeling grounded, feeling held. Breathing in again, pulling in this energy of earth, this unconditional love and abundance and eagerness and potential. Pulling that up all the way up to the heart space with the inhale. Holding. And as we exhale, letting that earth energy settle in the body, trusting its flow, no force, no control, just receiving, receiving, receiving. And now following our roots back down to the seed, being present with the seed as we continue to inhale and exhale at a pace that feels comfortable, that feels connective. And now focusing in on the seed, seeing it start to shake, start to pulse. As you slowly seed, see a root emerge from the bottom of the seed at the same time as a green shoot emerges from the top. And as you breathe and see this growth of the seed, Take note of how the root and the shoot of the seed begin to wrap around your roots, begin to grow up into your awareness, seeing the roots extend deeper into earth and breathing that earth energy up into the body again, receiving with the inhale, And receiving again with the exhale as that earth energy stays within our energy field, within our body, helping us feel supported and abundant. And now focusing in on that green shoot, seeing it grow, seeing it twirl and unfurl and dance, taking note of how it wants to move with and around our roots. Noticing what happens in the body as that green shoot touches our root, grows with it, uses our root as a pillar for which it can grow on, for which it can use to reach up now past the soil, coming through the earth and out into the light, into the sun. As this plant grows, as this shoot unfurls, the energy is moving into the body, into our experience, into our present moment, feeling that energy of potential, of growth, of expansion, of reaching toward the light, of receiving the mineralization from earth and the energy from the sun through all of our being. 
And as this beautiful plant is here now in the sunlight, allow this plant to share with you more of who it is, what it has for you here and now. Allowing this plant to take shape, noticing if it wants to become a tree or a shrub or just an herb or a flower. There's no right, there's no wrong. Just taking note of how this plant is growing for you. Noticing the leaves, the texture, the color. And now asking the plant if there is a smell or a taste that is coming forward into your experience as this plant unfurls itself to you. This is a plant that wants to be in connection with you for this spring season. This is a plant that has medicine, energy, magic for you, for your creations, for your expansion, for your growth. And letting this plant become known to you now. Maybe it's an herb. Maybe it's a type of food or a flower. Whatever it is, it's the exact right plant for you, for now. And you are open to its energies. You are open to its wisdom. You are open to its desire to co-create with you. And just breathing in this energy of the plant for two more breaths, pulling that energy into the body with the inhale and letting that energy settle in every cell of your being with your exhale. Good. And even if the plant isn't known, it's in your cells now. So know that for the next few weeks, there might be a plant that becomes more and more in your awareness. And this is the plant for you. Giving thanks to the plant, giving thanks to Mother Earth, giving thanks to the energy of spring of regrowth, regeneration, rebirth, giving thanks to yourself, the seed that is your soul, the faith in your growth, in your potential, in knowing that you have everything you need inside of you. It's always been there. It will always be there. And you just get to accept and grow with it. Gently wiggling your fingers and your toes. And when you feel ready, opening your eyes. <sighs> that was so nice. We just did the same exit. Thank you, Raquel. I know. That was so nice. My pleasure. I was just thinking it's so beautifully full circle that we started the show with me talking about how I feel like I have an increased sensitivity with my plants. So hopefully after this meditation listeners feel that certain plant, just like you were saying, calling out to them and, you know, called to develop a relationship. So you're amazing. Where can everyone find you to continue learning from you? And pre-orders are probably open for your book. So do you want to share that too? You can find everything on my website, ourinfinitenature.co. I should, at that point, you'll see there's be a whole book section so you can find it there. You can also find me on Instagram. That is where I am the most active. So you can find me at Our Infinite Nature Raquel on Instagram. You can also find me on TikTok. And if you love working with moon energy, you can also find my moon blog on my website. You can subscribe there. And you can find me on YouTube where I share videos for the moon energies as well. So that's at Our Infinite Nature Raquel on YouTube as well. And your two books, Everyday Plant Magic. And then what's the new book that's coming out? Everyday Plant Magic is the book that's already out. Self-Care for Eco Anxiety is the book that is coming out in April of 2024. And for those people who love to create with succulents in particular, if you want to use spring as a time to get really creative and use plants for art, then you can also check out my first book, which is Infinite Succulents, which is a succulent craft book. So yeah, and you can find all of those on my website or on Amazon. You're amazing. Oh, you're amazing. Yeah. Your evolution has been amazing. We're going to link to everything in the show notes. And until 
Well, we'll have you back because we're going to do an episode on eco-anxiety. But then, you know, summer solstice. Can't wait to have you back. Yes. And I hope we get to make flower crowns together for that because I want to make a flower crown with you. Absolutely. (laughs) 100%. (laughs) Let's do it. (laughs) Love it. Maria, you're incredible. And you definitely epitomize the energy of spring with all that Aries energy too. And just the way you love to grow. I mean- With all my Aries energy, baby. Growing joy. Like you have been focused on growing joy for so long. That's spring. (laughs) Yeah, that's you. Mm, Love you, friend. That's spring. All right, love you too. Thank you so much, Raquel. You can find her at Our Infinite Nature on socials. We'll link to all of her stuff in the show notes. She's so magical. This is such a great conversation. I've been thinking about it since the minute we had it. I'm so excited to have her back as we move into summer, as we move into fall, as we move into winter. I just feel like tuning ourselves to Earth's frequencies is part of the answer for reducing stress, increasing joy, growing joy. (laughs) and growing happy plants. So I hope this episode was inspiring. I wish you a very happy spring equinox, my friends. And until next week, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle, inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.